Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Woodpeckers 101. I hope you're all in the right place. I am James Stevenson, and I'll be presenting to you this afternoon, coming to you from, obviously, my office uh, here at Brooker Creek Preserve. I work for the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences right here in Pinellas County. Every county has an extension of the University of Florida, and we provide research-based information, the truth, on a variety of subjects. Here at Brooker Creek, up in the preserve, we tend to focus on uh, natural resource conservation, wildlife appreciation, things like uh, plant identification, just nature in general, things that uh, people have an, uh, a natural curiosity for. And the funny thing is that uh, just doing some kind of client surveys, it turns out that woodpeckers are, in fact, something that quite a lot of people are interested in. Um, everyone's heard of woodpeckers, even non-birdie people. I hope we have some non-birdie people here that are interested in learning something new. Uh, everyone seems to have heard of woodpeckers, but things like, did you know that we have five different woodpeckers right here in Pinellas County? Did you know that we do not have red-headed woodpeckers in Pinellas County? Those are the kind of things that we're going to explore today as far as the world of woodpeckers. And I'd like to invite you uh, to ask questions throughout. And what I'll do is I'm kind of flying solo today. I don't have a, a co-pilot that we normally have the luxury of. So if you'd please avail yourself of the Q&A, the question and answer tab, it should be on your controls somewhere on your screen. Uh, type your question in there and uh, I promise I will get to the ones that I can answer. No, I will certainly address the questions uh, at the end, if you don't mind. And we'll just kind of crash on with today's presentation and we'll save our questions to the end. So what we're looking at today, the world of woodpeckers, which is probably a lot more vast than you ever thought. Uh, how woodpeckers live, you know, why peck the wood? Um, some local species and finally, uh, the so what, you know, okay, now I know a lot about woodpeckers. Where do we go from here? Well, there's some things that you can do to actually benefit not only our local woodpeckers, but wildlife in general. But before we get too far into it, full disclosure, uh, my profession is botany, my background is botany. And to a botanist, a lot of times, this is what um, bird watching is all about. You can see this diagram of a sparrow and to a botanist, here's bird. Oh, but I know what it's standing on. It's standing on the red maple. Uh, it's standing on um, a maple, Acer. Anyway, that was a joke. Worldwide woodpeckers. Let's look at the distribution of woodpeckers throughout the planet. And you can see they're just about everywhere. Uh, woodpeckers as a group diverged from the rest of the birds um, after Australia had floated off and done its own thing. So we do not have existing woodpeckers in Australia, but just about everywhere else in the world. And you can see the distribution map here. The color coding, the darker red, means the greater the number of species. And you can see the highest number of species is, let me grab my highlighter pen, uh, the greatest diversity of species, the most different kinds, most different species of woodpeckers are right here in Southeast Asia of all places, they seem, as a group, they seem to love the jungles. And that is where we believe the epicenter, uh, that and uh, Central South America is kind of where we have the highest diversity of the woodpeckers throughout the world. They don't love the Sahara. They don't love the Arabian desert. They're not found in the Namib 
uh, down here in Southwest Africa, but we do have a few desert species here in North America. So they're not completely averse to living in very dry conditions, but you can see they love the tropics. They love the tropics and there's a good uh, distribution throughout the temperate areas as well. A jungle species uh, that can be found in South America is the yellow-throated woodpecker. Uh, and can you just see by looking at this thing, despite the fact that it's greenish yellow, it just has the familial characteristics of this group of birds. It's got that heavy beak. It's got a characteristic red stripe on its crown. Uh, woodpeckers often have kind of checkered or mottled feather patterns. So there's an example of a jungle species. And so this woodpecker is quite happy flying around high humidity, uh, large trees, tall canopies, uh, making its living as a woodpecker there. In the desert in North America, we have this species, uh, the Gila woodpecker, uh, and it finds its needs on the, uh, the cacti that are as big as trees. Now they're technically not trees, we don't need to go into that, but they're the big standing structures where woodpeckers can use that heavy bill to excavate the cavities that woodpeckers depend on for a part of their life cycle. And you can see here we have Again, the familial characteristics that tell you that this is a woodpecker. It has the checker striped, uh, checker patterned, the black and white bold colors. And you can even see a hint of that little red crown, that little bit of red striping on the roof. I almost said the roof, the, on the crown of that bird. Here in the Southeast US, we have our big happy, loud woodpecker, the pileated wood, woodpecker. Some people say pileated, I say pileated. Um, here we have one, again, using that big chisel-like bill uh, to excavate the nesting cavity where it is going to uh, take up residence. Here it is sticking its face out of the cavity that it has excavated into um, not a man-made structure. Of course, a telephone pole is made of tree. So, but a human has stuck this uh, kind of dead tree up into an urban situation. Undeterred, our woodpecker has found a way in to make its nesting cavity. Our red-bellied woodpecker is the most common that we are going to see here in Pinellas County. And of course, this one gets confused with, rightly so, gets confused with, and is often called a red-headed woodpecker. But I'm gonna underscore again, we do not have red-headed woodpeckers in Pinellas County. We do not have the habitat. We're all developed. We're all paved over. We do not have the habitat that red-headed woodpeckers need. Now, this is a woodpecker with a red head, Let's not get too caught up in that. Technically, this is the red-bellied woodpecker, even though you can't really see it when it's standing on a tree. So this is a forest dweller. And so this uh, species is adapted to living in flooded forests like we have up here at Brooker Creek. Again, the red coloration, uh, the stripes and checkers, the bold black and white stripes um, and checker patterns that identify or help identify this family. As far as a historical context, uh, a lot of people like to know the extremes. Uh, what's the biggest woodpecker that ever lived? Uh, the largest woodpecker in human history, since humans have been bird watching and taking notes and writing down and uh, identifying species, was the imperial woodpecker. And this one stood close to, you know, almost three feet tall, 23 inches, uh, close to 
if this was standing next to you, if this woodpecker, the imperial, was standing next to you and you're sitting in a chair, he could put his little chin on your knee and you could pet his imperial crown. That's how big this woodpecker was. Probably extinct, uh, pressures of habitat loss, uh, human um, people ate them, um, led to their decline. It's always, it seems like it's always the habitat loss, right? And human encroachment on habitat. Today, uh, in Southeast Asia, remember that kind of epicenter of uh, woodpecker diversity, the largest living or extant woodpecker is the great slaty woodpecker, another giant up to 23 inches. You could probably, you know, pat this one on the head if it were standing next to you. Uh, and it's still around, uh, a very large um, jungle dwelling a woodpecker still around today, worth visiting. So from one extreme to the other, and despite its size, the slides that we've seen so far, I'm pretty sure that if we compared all the birds and all the slides that we've seen thus far, that you would be able to see that these birds are in fact related to each other. And if I threw the picture of that sparrow from way in the beginning back up, you could see that the woodpeckers hold together very nicely as a family of birds with familial characteristics that make them woodpeckers and distinct from other groups of birds like the sparrows, the penguins, and so on. The smallest woodpecker uh, is the piculette, um, about the size of a wren. If you have wrens around your house, you know they're just little songbirds, so tiny little thing. Doesn't take too much of an imagination, even on this tiny little bird. Look, it's e it even has a little tending towards red blaze. Uh, again, the chisel shaped, very straight and, and stout uh, beak, uh, stripes and checkers. Again, the, the plumage, I always wanna say foliage when I'm talking about birds, but it's plumage. Uh, the stripes and the checkers characteristic of the family. So what do we we can see the familial similarities between these individuals that we've met thus far from all around the world. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the familial characteristics that we most use to classify species into this group uh, is that chisel like beak. Uh, zygodactyl. That means that uh, these birds have two toes that point forwards and two toes that point backwards. Um, you can just about see that here. Uh, this pileated woodpecker has two. There's one and in the background you can kind of see the nail of the second and this would be one of the kind of hind toes that point backwards. So they've got two claws on the tree going upwards and two claws behind kind of holding everything together. Those grasping claws uh, with equal pressure uh, from both directions combined with the strength of the stiff feathers of the tail and the strong musculature that can hold those tail feathers against the trunk of the tree uh, helps, the, helps these birds get the purchase they need, get the traction or the grip that they have on the trees, allowing them, them then with the bracing of their tail um, to slam their head against the trunk of the tree and not fall off. That's another familial characteristic, the ability and the propensity uh, to peck, giving, the, of course, this group its name. Woodpeckers are, generally speaking, omnivorous. They feed on seeds. Mostly when it comes to eating plants, they feed on the seeds. Uh, some that we'll meet in a little bit actually feed on plant sap. Perhaps you've heard of the sap suckers. They're not actually suckers, that they're lickers, but we'll call them sap suckers just the same. Generally speaking, omnivorous, eating insects as well. Here we have an image of a true red 
headed woodpecker. These occur in old growth forest, uh, larger tracts of land, older trees, uh, areas where very, very old large trees have died, have not been cut down and turned into lumber. Um, the red-headed woodpecker can be found as nearby as Brooksville, uh, Pasco County. If you go to some uh, of the preserves just north of Pinellas, you start getting into territory where you might see the red-headed woodpeckers, but it is very, very rare for them to make their way into Pinellas County. It's only been recorded a couple of times and they were probably off course anyway. Back to generalizations about the group. Omnivorous cavity nesters I mentioned before. So they spend part of their life cycle inside of a tree cavity. Very often cavities that have been created by themselves using that chisel like beak to excavate a cavity, a hole into a tree or by another member of their family. So a red headed woodpecker could very easily move into the cavity that had been created by a pileated woodpecker. So that is kind of how that works, but they do nest in cavities. Uh, their flight pattern is quite interesting and it's not unique to woodpeckers, but it is definitely distinctive if you uh, can, once, you, once you've seen it, you can recognize a woodpecker flight pattern. There's a strong, powerful, um, uh, thrusting, flapping flight, and then a long, shallow dip right back up to the same level and a powerful thrusting uh, straight forward and then a slow, shallow dip. So kind of a wavy pattern with a, with a leveling out right at the top. So that swooping flight that it's um, characterized. All the slamming of the head against the tree. How can that be good? It is an evolutionary adaptation that has allowed this group of birds access to resources that aren't available to competitors. So the ability to slam their he head into the trunk of a tree, flaking off bits of bark, excavating holes, um, is an adaption that these birds maintain throughout the entire family. How do they do it without getting hurt? How do they do it without getting headaches? Well, adaptations that have evolved along with the development into the um, extent that this behavior is expressed today, adaptations to the actual texture of the brain. Uh, their brain has lost some of its wrinkliness, uh, which allows for um, if the brain should come close or touch the skull, uh, it's not going to, um, it, it's going to be a much uh, smoother contact than it would be with a more wrinkly brain. They have very little cerebrospinal fluid. So the brain is nice and, and packed in. It's not wobbling around inside a lot of juice, a lot of cerebral spinal juice. Uh, and they have this hyoid bone, uh, their hyoid bone, which we have right here, it kind of holds our tongue muscles in place. Theirs reaches all the way up over their head and it allows for their tongue to fit into a nice groove that wraps around their head. Uh, number one, it allows them to have an extra long tongue because they've got all this space to tuck it away. And number two, it's kind of like a seatbelt. So it has its tongue kind of holding its brain in place as it hammers away at the tree trunk. Why? all the pecking, why, especially this time of year, for excavating, which we mentioned before, for excavating for food, uh, and for creating the hollows, the cavities uh, for nesting. Here we have what 
looks like a red, I mean, yeah, a red belly, perhaps a red belly. This one's having a go at a palm tree and palm trees, uh, like the cactus, they're the biggest plants around and they can certainly accommodate a cavity, even though they're not really trees. Um, nonetheless, uh, excellent for excavating cavities because they're very fibrous. They're a little bit softer, a little bit easier to excavate cavities in. So here we have um, what looks like a red-bellied woodpecker excavating what will hopefully will be its nesting cavity. So pecking for food, creating a home, but sometimes woodpeckers just peck. And starting around now, we're moving into uh, nesting season for a lot of our a lot of our resident birds that nest here. Uh, and of course, nesting is preceded by courtship, pair bonding, uh, mate searching, um, advertising for mates. A lot of times the males will find a nice hollow or otherwise resonant, resonant structure and just drum at it and hopefully make the loudest noise that will cover the loudest amount of distance. Uh, that drumming establishes that male's territory. It's an announcement uh, and it's also a way to attract a mate. Uh, the bird can advertise that it is smart enough to have found the loudest possible thing to drum up against. Uh, and the sound that carries the furthest, of course, is going to get the most attention of any nearby potential mates. Uh, this can be annoying to humans. Uh, and at extension services, we take phone calls a lot for people who need some advice from someone who's not trying to sell them something. That's what we kind of specialize in. If you have a problem in your garden, you have a sick plant, uh, you're not sure if your lawn needs fertilizing or cutting back on water, you call extension because we're going to give you the information for free. If you ask the same question at a garden center, they're going to tell you, of course, you need to buy something and here it is and go in, whether that's true or not. Anyway, we get calls about the woodpeckers and how can I get rid of the woodpeckers? Well, you just kind of have to wait it out. I put in the uh, chat box a few resources and one of those is a link to one of our publications um, dealing with uh, the loud drumming if it becomes an issue year after year if you've got a particularly a persistent male that comes and stays and drums on a particular part of your house year after year there's some solutions in that publication that's there in the chat for you to examine so Slamming your head for food, slamming your head to build a home, uh, and finally to advertise for a mate and establish the territory. Feeding is done by using that chisel-like beak to open holes in the trunks of trees. Then comes the tongue. And I mentioned that the tongue can be uh, wrapped up and ar around the head and the brain uh, when it's put away, it can be extended up to like four times the, the, the size of the animal's head. So imagine what that would be like. Uh, it's very sticky. It can be covered in mucus. It could be covered in uh, tiny little barbs. Uh, it could be covered in uh, a brush-like texture all these to adhere to or excavate uh, insects, grubs, larva, that sort of thing from inside tree trunks. So we're gonna mention this again, but there's a lot more dead, there's a lot more grubs, termites, insects, larva inside dead trees dead trees have a lot more life in them than live trees. And so oftentimes the woodpeckers are going to be found around dead trees, excavating all those termites, excavating all those wood boring beetles. 
Here, this one, this drawing is one with a carpenter ant that would have been uh, chewing its way into the dead wood of a dead tree. So dead tree is very important for um, woodpecker health, but we'll mention that again in a minute. So feeding is the long sticky tongue uh, preceded by that um, probing chisel-like bill. Breeding, of course, cavity nesters, as I've said several times, um, generally speaking, across the family, four to six eggs. So that's a pretty large uh, brood size. Uh, once the chicks have left the nest, once they have fledged, uh, typically across this family, the male will take half the brood and move them off and kind of teach them how to um, bash their head into a tree for food. Um, and the mother will take the other half. So it's an interesting uh, resource allocation. They actually stay together even through, even though they're not together, they um, kind of stay together as a family, if you know what I mean. And they tend to be monogamous through an entire season. So um, pick your mate in the spring, hang out, have as many broods as time and resources will allow in a new cavity each time. So how long do woodpeckers live? It depends on the species, of course. Um, generally speaking, four to up to 12 years. 12 would be the upper end for some of the larger species, if that makes sense. Otherwise, um, other factors that would influence longevity would be the availability of resources, the availability of, you know, nesting, um, no persecution, uh, lack of predators, you know, all the kind of pressures that would be for any living thing certainly apply to woodpeckers as well. Certainly, um, some birds have been seen coming to feeders, which of course is supplemental food, unnecessary, but sometimes things like feeders can unnaturally prolong animals' lives. You hear about um, animals living for X number of years in captivity, whereas a natural lifespan might be much shorter. Um, supplemental feeding at bird feeders kind of acts like that captivity as well. It's not necessarily a detriment, um, it's just a thing. The threats, as I mentioned before, of course, are mostly, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly the destruction of habitat, the destruction of the elimination of dead trees for nesting, the elimination of dead trees for uh, food resources, uh, persecution. Um, I, when I was a little kid, had a neighbor and the dad would actually BB gun anything that he thought looked like a woodpecker because he thought it was harming the tree or making too much noise. So there is persecution for simply being a woodpecker in certain areas. The foliage, as I mentioned before, because I like to call it foliage when it's actually plumage, uh, the feathers of the woodpeckers, they share the characteristics, as I've mentioned before, uh, the bold colors, the black and white striping, a little bit of red on the head. So black, a predominant color, uh, the black and white contrast, the red head, but yellow is actually, um, yellow as a feather color pops up here and there. Uh, this is a photograph of a flicker, a type of woodpecker um, that gets to be called something else, although you can see the familial uh, characteristics. You can see the shape of those prop feathers on the tail, very, very strong, strengthened. Uh, the rachis, that midrib, is very, very strong. Uh, the black pigment in the tail actually helps strengthen the the feather as well, but you can see the bright red display colors that are hidden when this animal is at rest with its wings folded up. Woodpeckers don't sing. They don't have a melody. They don't advertise with a, a nice long melodious song like a, like a mockingbird would do, but they do have a voice uh, and they do have distinctive calls that have distinctive meanings, especially vocal 
uh, during the breeding season, using the calls and the drumming uh, to establish territory and to advertise for a mate. Here is the worldwide list of all the woodpeckers that we know of that are currently alive. Certainly we have lost several and there have been versions of woodpeckers within this family <clears throat> historically that have gone extinct through natural causes. But today we are left with approximately 250 different versions of woodpecker around the world. This is where I take a sip of tea. Everyone have a sip of tea. <clears throat> Yum. <clears throat> so you can see this large group, 250 species. Scientists love to categorize things and, and put them into smaller and smaller containers of similarly assembled members. So we have various subfamilies within the woodpeckers. Uh, and within the subfamilies, we have different tribes. And the largest subfamily are what are referred to as the true woodpeckers that are in these six tribes. And we have representatives of two, three, two, of these tribes right here in Pinellas County. And even within the tribes, you've got the different genera and within the genera, you can see the different species. I can promise you though, that not one of these 250 species, not one um, wears gloves like Woody here. In Pinellas, Within this woodpecker family, within this tribe, pie can I, how do you want to say that? We have two different genera, the pileated woodpecker and the flicker. In the tribe Melanerpe, we've got the sap sucker and the red bellied woodpecker. We don't have the red-headed woodpecker, although it's in the same genus, and the downy woodpecker. So two tribes. Let's start with our pileated woodpecker, our largest resident woodpecker, and it is the largest in North America. It's not as big as our Asian slaty woodpecker, but it's an impressive woodpecker, and it is the largest in North America, and it's an eastern species. The flicker, uh, which we met before, is a member of the woodpecker clan. Uh, it's in the same tribe as the pileated. Uh, and here we have this flicker again, uh, the same individual that we saw flying off before with those familial characteristics, the stripes, the black, the red, and so on. Sapsuckers are not resident in Pinellas County. They are winter visitors. And when they are here, they have an interesting uh, lifestyle of using their beak to open holes in the side of trees that allows the sap to collect. And we'll talk a little bit more about them. That gives them their name, the sap suckers. Mentioned the red-headed woodpecker before, Melanerpes is the genus. You have to go a little bit further north to visit them, definitely worth a visit there. Very shocking and, and exciting to see, but not here in Pinellas. But the red belly is the one that we're going to see the most. This one is perfectly adapted to urban situations, loves our neighborhood trees, makes a perfectly good living. We'll talk a little bit about its lifestyle uh, coming up in a minute. And finally, the little downy woodpecker. This is a tiny, tiny, this is our smallest woodpecker um, in Pinellas County, arguably in Florida. Um, little thing, again, with the familial characteristics that help identify it as a woodpecker. If you don't notice it pecking, it'll peck something thinner than a pencil. It'll go after little, little twigs, but it's doing its job. It's doing its very small job. 
the pileated woodpecker, again, our largest, um, very impressive to see, very well illustrates that gliding and dipping and gliding and dipping habit that it has uh, in flight. You can tell males and females apart in most woodpecker species, although they're more alike than different. You, uh, the differences between male and female can be observed with binoculars. You don't have to take them apart, thankfully. Um, you can get visual cues to help tell the difference between males and females. And in the pileated woodpecker, it is, I'll show you the difference, but it's this little red mustache there. That's what the male has. The diet of the pileated woodpecker has been documented. Um, classic grad student project to sit and stare at pileated woodpecker, the same pileated woodpecker all day, every day, see which eats, then um, go back again the next day, do the same thing and see what they're eating. There was some um, research done with animals that had hit windows and expired, uh, an examination of their stomach contents. All this data put together shows that generally the pileated woodpeckers live on ants. They're ant eaters, and they're not alone in that. There are the flickers as well, another group of woodpeckers that feed almost primarily on ants. Um, the pileateds are excellent cavity builders. Being so large, they build large cavities. Being so large, they have you know the, the biggest toolkit in order to get that job done. Um, every year a new cavity, almost with every nest a new cavity. And oftentimes the original cavity that is constructed by the pair, the female will eventually say, no, I don't like that. I'm not putting any eggs in there. And they'll go and try again, leaving that cavity available for another species of woodpecker or another species of animal altogether. The small screech owls love to move into abandoned pileated woodpeckers uh, cavity. Pileateds are adapting in living memory to human activity. Whereas historically, when humans would come into an area, the pileateds would be long gone. They would one whiff of human and they're out of here. But slowly, these are becoming more and more accustomed to and are more comfortable around developed areas. Now, this is a good thing because it's preventing loss of habitat. If they can move into human habitat, that's good. But it also exposes them to added dangers of things like collisions with buildings, um, outdoor cats, um, just you know, collisions with um, wires, uh, guy wires on on utility poles, that sort of thing. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a double-edged sword. Their ability to adapt to humans. Here you can see um, the female, no red mustache there. The male with a nice red mustache there. Uh, the female here inspecting this cavity that has been excavated in a dead tree. Again, the importance of dead trees for the survival of many species, not just the birds. And here we have the male uh, hammering away at what appears to also be a dead tree. You start to see the signs of the lichen, um, excuse me, the um, mushrooms emerging from the bark of the tree. That usually indicates that the fungus is running around consuming wood that is dead. So this is probably a dead tree, nice and soft, and the male is excavating a cavity for nesting. The northern flicker. The flicker is a very distinctive uh, woodpecker, even though it's referred to as a flicker. These are often found on the ground. These um, have the plumage, the feather patterns, of the family, the stripes, uh, but they also have these really designer dots 
Uh, these are the ones where you can see the bright yellow color, their flash underneath their wings. Uh, the males and females also dimorphic in that uh, the male is going to have a much more pronounced um, colorations and striping on its face uh, and this very um, pronounced uh, breast plate. So the flickers are often found around human development. Uh, this is an actual photograph taken from the backyard of um, my erstwhile co-pilot, uh, Julia. Um, this is actually her palm tree, and the flicker has been working on this cavity uh, to raise this year's young. Unfortunately, because it's not all happiness and rainbows and snow white out there, another species of bird decided that it wanted the flicker's cavity. It was a European starling. The European starling moved out. You can just about see that's the top of the European starling's head. Um, that's his really mean looking eye. Uh, the flicker tried to go into its cavity. The European starling said, this is mine now and beat up this poor little thing, uh, causing him to abandon that cavity lost to the European starlings. So all that hard work for nothing, right? Uh, the yellow bellied sapsucker, these are winter visitors and we get them here in Brooker Creek. They, again, they like older trees. They like particular species. Their way of life is migratory, as I mentioned, and they spend, um, their winters passing through or hanging out in this these blue areas here, and they breed up here way far north. So these are one of the long migratory species. Um, and what the sap suckers do to feed is they make these nice little regular patterns of, um, of holes. They're called sap wells that the um, the sap suckers very carefully excavate just under the surface of the bark right where uh, the actively growing living tissue is that's carrying the water and more importantly the sap full of sugar um, that the sap suckers can feed on it's like nectar it's it's sugar water that collects in these little these little pools but the pools of nectar or sap also attract insects that want that sticky sweet treat. And so the, the sap suckers will also uh, use these little sap wells as bait and pick the uh, insects that are attracted to that sugary exudate um, from their excavation. The red headed woodpecker that we don't have, but we definitely would love for you to um, travel out of county to go visit because they're such a such a beautiful and, and bold looking bird. Uh, they like more open spaces with big old dead trees. And those two things don't really go together in a very overly developed county like Pinellas. A, we don't have great big open spaces, and B, we have a very low threshold for dead trees in our developed areas, unfortunately. Um, these will also feed, like I mentioned before, uh, on the seeds of plants in, um, in the form of the nuts the of the uh, oak trees, the acorns. They'll actually collect these uh, and hammer them into, they'll hammer a hole into the side of a tree, stuff an acorn in it, tap it down to, to firm it in there and make this kind of cupboard full of acorns for consuming later. Unfortunately, uh, these tend to fly low to the ground. They have that uh, soaring and dipping flight pattern that's um, found in, in woodpeckers. But unfortunately, they tend to fly about three feet off the ground, about a meter off the ground, which is right at automobile height. 
and a lot of birds are struck uh, simply crossing the road because that's how high they fly or how low they fly. Um, so that's a little bit of a bummer, a little bit of a, um, a flaw that hopefully, it's not a flaw, it's just a bad, it's a bummer. Uh, hopefully evolution can catch up and get them to fly higher, I don't know. Anyway, most common red belly. You don't get to see the red belly unless one of these things is dead and you can pick it up and hold it. The red belly isn't really much to write home about, but because redheaded had already been taken, had to come up with something. And here we have a really excellent photograph uh, from Fish and Wildlife proving that this species does arguably have a red belly. This is the one that we're going to see in most of our trees around the county. This one has a really chill lifestyle. lifestyle. I think if I had to be a woodpecker, I would be uh, a red-bellied woodpecker. No slamming of, no, very little slamming of head, just kind of eats things that are already on the surface, not really looking inside the bark for anything, just, oh, a caterpillar, I'll have that. It's right here on the surface. Oh, an acorn, I'll have that. Just kind of gleans more than, more than excavates. When it's time to nest, if it finds uh, a cavity that's already been made, hooray, doesn't have to make its own. This is one that will use a nest box. If you put a nest box up, it's gonna say, hey, a cavity, man, I don't have to make my own, let's move in here. Uh, this one also will put away food for that rainy day. We'll pick up acorns, put them in a hollow of a tree, tap it in, uh, and make this larder um, for chilling out later. And here we have a couple of shots of the red-bellied woodpecker uh, in a variety of behaviors. Here we have a male and a female, um, the male with a much larger coverage of red that goes all the way from the base of the head to the nose. In the female, it only goes about a third of the way uh, from the from the neck to the tip. Here we have one who's thinking or itching or both, uh, carrying around a uh, an acorn for stashing later on. Uh, all these photographs taken by our friend uh, Marcelo, who visits the preserve very regularly and gets to see this behavior firsthand. And the little tiny downy woodpecker. This one is. Uh, very, very cute. And here you can see that zygodactyl with the two facing forward and the two facing backward. So zygodactyl, Ace, um, symmetrical in, in two directions. Uh, there are smaller woodpeckers we saw, the piculets, but as far as North America goes, this is our littlest. And um, they're all over North America. They don't like the desert, but they don't seem to mind the swamp. We saw one right at eye level today along the boardwalk here at Burger Creek. Very, very active, uh, very vocal. Um, their voice kind of matches their size. They kind of squeak more than call. Um, and they will feed with other species. And that is exactly where we saw ours today. Um, it was moving with a pack of, I believe there were tit mice. There were definitely tit mice in there, uh, blue gray gnat catchers um, and wrens and some of the warblers, the yellow rumped warblers and, and vireo, that kind of little brown jobs. Uh, but this will move with them through a forest, uh, pecking, gleaning, eating, uh, whatever they can find primarily insects, but this time of year, seeds as well. It does have a looky like. Uh, another one of our winter visitors is this black and white warbler. And the black and white warbler tends to climb up and down the trunks of trees, just like woodpeckers do. And it does have that bold black and white coloration, uh, but what it doesn't have is the heavy bill. It has more of a, a tweezer-like bill that it uses to tweeze things. These aren't related. 
they just have similar coloration. Uh, the downy woodpecker also has the checkers as well as the stripes um, that we've seen characteristic of other members of the family. So how can we help our woodpeckers now that we've met our five species? Is there anything we can do to help? Well, throughout, I hope I've mentioned some of the threats that pose the woodpeckers and maybe suggested certain ways that you can help. Certainly, if it's within your sphere of influence, not to remove dead trees from your property. Leaving a dead tree has enormous environmental benefits, believe it or not. Maybe not aesthetic, but environmental. If it suits your aesthet aesthete, um, if it is within the rules of where you live, um, if it doesn't pose any danger to you, yourself, your family, or your neighbors, consider leaving a dead tree right where it is, standing uh, to slowly decompose, fill up with the agents of decomposition from the fungus, uh, through the beetle larva, to the termites, to the carpenter ants, you know, give the termites something natural to eat and maybe they'll leave your house alone. In turn, that feeds the birds, allows for cavity building to happen, uh, nesting, following, and these sorts of things. So dead trees are actually an excellent, excellent thing in the landscape. Tolerate a certain amount of pests on your landscape plants. Um, would Peckers love to eat insects. Um, a lot of insects pop. A lot of um, a lot of insects larvae make wonderful food. Caterpillars are probably the best bird food in the world, especially when nesting. Caterpillars are very nutrient dense. Uh, you can shove caterpillars down baby bird. Well, if you're a bird, you can shove caterpillars down your baby's throats without harming the child, the baby bird, the chick. Um, and yet shoving that nutrient dense meal. Um, but caterpillars eat plants. And so tolerating a whole bunch of caterpillars eating your fill in the blank um, allows for food for these species of woodpeckers and other things. Consider putting up a nest, bo nest box, maybe a species like the red belly, who can't always be bothered to build its own nest cavity, would then come and move in and help spread the word, especially when it comes to the annoying drumming that woodpeckers will perform on hollow resonant surfaces uh, like gutters, mailboxes, all these things, remind them that it's brief and that, you know, this is a very intelligent bird. It has found the loudest thing that it could find. Maybe give that a heads up. It's not behavior that happens all night long and it's only during the breeding season. So have a little tolerance, educate others, put up an S box, Love that dead tree. Those are things that you can do to help. I'm going to get to the questions now. But first, I promised that I would launch a poll. So I'm going to launch this poll right quick. And if you wouldn't mind answering these very simple questions, you're going to help us develop our programming, uh, make our current programming even better. Um, and, you know, it's it's a small ask for this hour of this gloomy day um, to learn a little bit about woodpeckers. Tell us what you'd like to learn more about, indicate uh, your level of engagement today and so on. And as soon as we get um, a good percentage in, maybe 70% of attendees, we have a nice good crowd today. I really appreciate you joining us today. Times are weird. We're doing everything, almost everything online. But it's going well. We hope to keep this up uh, and come to you in more accessible forms, more on demand. Uh, the recording of this presentation will be on our YouTube channel 
as soon as we get it proce processed and posted, um, we may even drop you a note or drop a note to those who registered for today's webinar, but we never sell your emails. We only use them for communications from us. If we could get any money, we'd probably sell them. Just kidding, but we can't and we don't. Um, excellent, we have a lot of response there. I'm gonna go ahead and end that, close that up. And I just wanted to mention on this slide, uh, we refer to this as the condo. Here you can see over several years, a woodpecker, a pileated woodpecker right here in our flooded forest um, excavated a cavity. The tree responded by, it was a living tree and the tree responded by trying to heal the wound. So it sealed up all the exposed tissue that had been um, insulted by the attack by the uh, woodpecker. Then the bottom rotted out because it filled up with water, filled up with dead leaves, rot happened, the bottom fell out, and it was time to move down a floor. Then the floor of that one rotted out and it was time to excavate again. So here we have a woodpecker taking advantage of this tree and its natural responses, sealing off the entrance, but can't fight nature and had to keep moving down the trunk of the tree. All right, I'm going to put up, as I answer questions, I'm going to put up uh, our YouTube, access to our YouTube channel. You can see a couple of archived presentations. Just look for Pinellas Extension and you will find us on YouTube. Those two words, Pinellas Extension. Uh, liking us on Facebook will help keep you apprised of all upcoming educational opportunities, webinars, and everything else. So on Facebook, we are Brooker Creek Environmental Education Center. If you need to comment or complain or just have a private thought to me personally, certainly drop me a line at my email address. And here we go with questions. we got nine in here. Are there any blue woodpeckers? That's an excellent, excellent question. And I think there are. That's both of our homework. The question is, are there blue woodpeckers? And I'm pretty sure that blue is a color in a woodpecker somewhere but I can't tell you the name of it because it's not up here. Excellent question. I'm gonna give that one up probably. Is, if it's an adaptation, how would it survive? I'm not quite, I think that one is a bit out of context. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know about the adaptation. Are any woodpeckers harmful to the trees that they live in? And are any woodpeckers in Hillsborough County protected? Excellent questions. Uh, are woodpeckers harmful to the trees that they live in? Mm. Generally speaking, no. Trees, of course, live to be very, very old. Trees are under constant attack. Trees create bark to protect their growing parts. Uh, if a tree is assaulted in any way, it can grow to cover wound areas. Um, it, I have a presentation that we did a few weeks ago uh, at the end of January called Life of a Dead Tree. Uh, that one is on our YouTube channel. And it, we go into depths about just how hard it is to kill a tree. It takes a lot to kill a tree. But once a tree is finally dead, a whole world of ecological services then take over. So in a small sense, no, woodpeckers don't have any, don't derive any benefit from harming a host tree. Well, if the tree were to fall down, it's game over. No nesting that year. Uh, if the sap suckers uh, go all the way around the living tissue of the tree and kill the tree, no more sap. So 
generally speaking, if one species depends on another for its survival, it's going to keep that species alive. As far as protected, our only protected woodpecker is the red cockaded woodpecker, which does occur in Florida and I believe is found in Hillsborough. I've never visited anywhere where red cockaded woodpeckers live, but they need an even narrower ecological niche. They need old, old pine trees in pine habitats that are pretty much undisturbed. Good luck finding those, certainly not in Pinellas County. Lots of active research and conservation efforts going on uh, for the red cockaded woodpecker. Why these old trees as far as the red, red headed woodpecker? It's just what they like. They need, it's like with the red cockaded. If they could just make do with some smaller, different species, anything, it's just the little way that their ecological evolutionary brains are wired. Um, I, I hate that there's not always an answer to why in biology. Um, you just have to say it, that's, it, it is, I can't really answer why, but an excellent question. And it's certainly worth pondering, um, you know, spend some time thinking, you know, what could have been the evolutionary ecological adaptation that selected for this particular behavior? What, if anything, has made this species so uh, specific to that one habitat type for reproduction. Sorry, Tina. Uh, again, Dan is asking if any woodpeckers are harmful to the trees they live in. Uh, oh, we already got to that one, didn't we? Thanks, Dan. Um, where can we see them in what time? Woodpeckers, thankfully woodpeckers are uh, diurnal. You can see them during the day. We don't have night active woodpeckers. You can go to just about any forest, uh, flooded forest like Brooker Creek. Brooker Creek is the best place to come to see anything. Not that I'm biased or anything, uh, but we're 50% upland. So we have the dry habitat species component. Those species that love pines, that love palmetto, um, the drier sandy soils, all those species. And we also have the species that favor the flooded forest, the swamp. So at Brooker Creek in you know, 30 minutes, you can walk our shortest trail and go halfway through a wetland, halfway through an upland and see the species that are associated there. And with patience and staying quiet and using a very sharp eye and listening out for the sounds of woodpeckers, you will not be disappointed. Woodpeckers are out there to be seen and enjoyed. And with most wildlife, early in the morning and late in the afternoon is the best time. Although on a day like this, when it's overcast and a little cool, they're out just as though it's a it's, uh, very early morning time. Where can you obtain a nest box? If you, um, Elizabeth, if you were to, um, drop a note into, you can uh, email me uh, for resources, but in the chat, if you can navigate towards the chat feature in your um, navigation toolkit down there, I put at the very beginning, helping cavity nesters in Florida. And it tells you, uh, it gives you resources on how to put one together yourself. Uh, otherwise, you can phone around to uh, either specialist stores that specialize in um, bird watching, these exist, um, that sell things like bird feeders, they sell bird seed, they sell binoculars, and they can also, they might also sell um, nest box materials or 
nest boxes that have already been put together. So there's quite a few uh, resources for obtaining a nest box. We're talking about suet feeders, which is quite interesting. Suet is a um, is animal fat that uh, it, the suet is the animal fat. Suet feeders are animal fat that are very often mixed with bird seeds, and it's a great uh, source of very 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 nutrient dense food for birds during the winter. And up north, where there's absolutely nothing on the trees in the winter time, these little suet feeders. Um, uh, can really supplement wild birds feeding. But the question is, the suet feeders are visited more often when you're there than when you're not. Do the downies and red bellies have between to it? That is weird. Um, the question is, the, the uh, Todd is saying that he's noticing that the woodpeckers come to the suet feeders when the people are there other than when you're inside watching the suet feeder. That's very interesting. It's interesting behavior. It's very likely, it's, well, it's not very likely, it's not unlikely that the birds are associating you with food, uh, that you are this advanced primate that's coming outdoors with the supplemental food, and that when the bird sees this advanced primate, it knows that it's going to get some sort of food reward. It's not outside the realm of possibilities. That's really cool. And congratulations, you've got woodpeckers coming right up to you. Can you make a hole in a tree for a woodpecker? That's a very good question, Heidi. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, woodpeckers tend to be uh, quite picky. How do you like that? I just did that accidentally. Woodpeckers are picky. Um, the, the do-it-yourselfers, the pileated woodpeckers, um, that's innate. They're gonna, the pileated woodpeckers are going to make the cavity. And if the female doesn't like it, he's making another one. So leave the pileateds to make their own. It's the pileateds that make the nest cavities that are then favored by others. Also, um, there might be a little bit of danger to yourself uh, in trying to excavate a hole into a tree. Again, leave it to those species that are adapted to making them. They've got the best equipment. They've got plenty of time. Um, it's a really nice thought. As a human, we would recommend putting together using human tools, um, nest boxes. Um, you never know what you're going to get in your nest box. It could be a woodpecker, it could be a screech owl, and it could be a hive of bees. All these things it could be squirrels, all kinds of things uh, love a cavity. So thank you for your thought, but I would kind of advise against that, making a hole for the woodpeckers yourself. And thank you very much. Uh, are woodpeckers at all harmful? Um, no. Woodpeckers will not hurt you. They will not hurt you unless you try to catch one or if you try to hurt one. If you try to catch a woodpecker, it has a very strong beak and it has an even stronger will to survive. And if the woodpecker feels threatened by you, if you're if you have your hands on it, it's going to defend itself. And all it's got is that big, strong beak, and it's going to use it. It's going to use its beak. It's going to use its claws as much as it can, and it's going to flap its wings. It's going to make as much of a racket and a kerfuffle as it possibly can uh, to get away. So the only way that a woodpecker can hurt you is if you are trying to catch or harm that woodpecker. And How's the best way to avoid that? Stay back. If a woodpecker enters into your living space and you need it out of your living space, it is definitely recommended to contact a licensed wildlife trapper to safely catch and release that animal. These are people that are trained on how to do the least harm to species that have accidentally got somewhere where they don't need to be.
So generally speaking, go enjoy the woodpeckers, enjoy where they are, um, visit their habitat. And if they accidentally come into your habitat, um, get a professional to get rid of them. Thank you for your questions. Those were awesome. Those were fantastic questions. Thanks for joining us today for Woodpeckers 101, an introduction to this fascinating group of cousins of these that live all together. Bye for now. And we hope that you will visit us next week for Plant Poison, two o'clock Wednesday, February 24. Uh, the following week, we'll get back onto one of my favorite subjects, uh, the insects and on March 3rd, We'll talk about the truth of pollinators. So uh, drop us a line to the email. Thanks for stopping by today. I'm going to go ahead and sign off and you guys enjoy your afternoon. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Bye.